Okay, welcome to Immunology, MLT 260. So we're going to look at Chapter 1. So all the lectures will be recorded, so you can actually listen to me talk, and we can always ask questions at any time, either email, text, or Zoom conference. Of course, we can always ask questions in the lab if you have any problem. Uh, so we'll be going prickly close to the textbook, so you can look at the outcomes and the chapter outline and the key terms. Uh, we'll look at some of the pictures as we go through and looking at some of the images also. And at the back of each chapter is a study guide for you to use if you have any problems. And there's some case studies to help you through answering things and then some review questions. And the back of the textbook will actually be the answers to the case studies and to the review questions. So we will have these uploaded for you to always look at. Okay, so let's move forward on this. So, chapter one has to deal with immunity and immunizations, what that actually means. What is the difference between the terms of innate and adaptive? What are the cells of the innate system, the cells of the adaptive system, and the different organs that are actually part of the immune system? So, <clears throat> excuse me, immunology. We're actually are going to be studying the host, which in for us a human's reaction to anything that's foreign. So we really have to come up what is our definition of a foreign substance. So the term we actually use is antigens. So antigens are a foreign thing that gets into a person that will actually induce an immune response. I mean the correct term for it is called immunogen, but always will hear antigens. So, a lot of things you already know that we uh, produce an immune response, you know, a host response. Um, stuff we're allergic to, like pollens, hay fever, dander, that kind of stuff. And of course, bacterial things, pathogens that we have. I mean, that's why you get a lot of immunizations to protect you against stuff. And right now, of course, the utmost important one is COVID. So we have uh, vaccines for that. So that's a foreign thing that gets in our body and will elicit an immune response. So the term immunity just means you have the condition of being resistant to the infection. Now you can still get the infection, but with Im immunity, you have an immune system that will help fight this off. So you might have very minor symptoms but will not get the full-fledged disease process or be sick, per se. So historically, in the past, uh, you can see a couple things, three things that are listed here. They're the top ones really out there. So in the 15th century, um, it sounds crazy, but people used to inhale the scabs of a small, smallpox um, so that we prevent smallpox. I mean, it sounds weird, but whatever. I mean, just think they didn't know half the stuff that we know now. I mean, a, a minuscule amount. In the 1700s, Jenner, he actually developed the smallpox vaccination from cowpox. And you've probably heard of that. The milk maidens, they got cowpox on their hands. So then he would get the cowpox and scratch it into a person. And that would allow them to develop immunity to it. You know, so they really didn't know what was going on. Um, Pasteur in the 1800s, he developed, you know, multiple vaccinations through what we call attenuation. Um, and you'll notice in your textbook, the things that are bold, of course, are the most important things. And of course, you know, we're going to go through the definitions of what they are. So attenuation just makes a pathogen weak. So they can make it less virulent, less disease producing. For instance, you can use heat. Uh, you can let it grow over a period of time so it gets old, so it's not as pathogenic. Or you can apply different kind of chemicals to it to make it extremely weak. So in other words, it, the, the bacteria, virus, whatever, might still be there, but the person will not produce antibodies. Or the person, excuse me, will produce antibodies, but they will not get sick from it. So, just getting down to, you know, the terms here. The first one is innate immunity, and that's basically what you're made with. That's the natural immunity of your body. 
Um, and that's just normal body functions that you have present that help you resist infections. And these are considered very non-specific things uh, that help you all the time. And we'll go through those here in a minute. So no prior exposure is necessary for that. Um, and it usually works immediately, quickly. But there is no memory from it. Now that will play an important part here in a little bit. Adaptive immunity, on the other hand, is extremely specific. In other words, it is for each individual pathogenic thing. Like you have immunity for chickenpox. You have immunity for like COVID. You have immunity for pneumonia. Stuff like that. Because what your body has a possibility, that, that the capability rather of doing is what's called a memory. So it can actually remember a prior exposure to whatever this foreign thing was, this antigen. And it will produce an immune response. So the next time you get exposed, it just takes, you know, less than 24 hours, even quicker a lot of times, uh, to you to produce an immune response to protect you. I mean, hence, that's what we call vaccinations. You know, so it allows you to get that first exposure so that now we develop a memory. We know we're like, oh my gosh, that's right. That's pneumonia per se. Um, I know how to produce antibodies. I know how to develop protection. And I can do that quick. So it's really fast. Uh, so it protects us. So that's why you get those little bit of symptoms, but your immune system will overcome them extremely quick. Now, the different cells of the immune system, uh, this will be basically what we talked about in hematology. So we're looking at leukocytes, WBCs. Of course, we know that they're in peripheral blood and lymphoid tissue. And the white cells play a very key role in the innate and adaptive immune system. So the different types of cells that we talk about in the immune system are neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, monocytes, macrophages, max cells, dendritic cells and lymphocytes. So we'll talk about them a little bit more here. You can always follow me in the textbook or we looking at the pictures you'll be able to follow along pretty quick. So all white cells come from stem cells that are located in the bone marrow and we call that the hematopoietic stem cells, HSC. And they all produce either common myeloid or common lymphoid precursors which eventually will make the individual cells. And you can see the picture on the right, you know, where we get the pluripotential stem cell, and then it will be committed to make either a myeloid or a lymphoid cell, and then it can produce the cells that it needs to produce. You know, because usually myeloid cells are very important in phagocytosis and eating stuff. I mean, you can see it, the dendritic cells all the way down, um, what say plates per se, but all the way down on the right hand side. The lymphoid precursors will develop lymphocytes and they play an important part of the immune system and we'll be getting in a lot of depth as to what lymphocytes actually do. So the PMNs, you know, in hematology we really don't call them that, um, but that just means the term polymorphonuclear cells. For instance, neutrophils, eosinophils and basophils, which you've all have heard before. Monocytes, uh, once monocytes get into tissue, they're actually called macrophages. Mast cells are actually tissue basophils, and then dendritic cells, which are cells that are also in the tissue itself. So this will be a little review of what we had in hematology. So neutrophils, you know, that's over half, 50 to 70 percent of all the white cells we see in the peripheral bloodstream. Of course, its main function is phagocytosis, you know, eating and destroying foreign things out there and if you look at the description of the cell in the picture you can see it's multi-lubed nucleus involved in there and it has neutral staining granules in the cytoplasm itself which the granules remember have lysosomes um, digestive enzymes in there so it does a very good job um, I mean that's the pus that you're talking about when you get to an infection eosinophils are definitely a smaller percentage like one to four percent Again, they are important in phagocytosis. 
Uh, but they're very important in neutralizing allergic reactions. I mean, that's one of the biggest things they do. That's why you see them increased. If somebody has an allergic response, particularly like asthma, that's one of the big ones we see it in. It's also important in uh, killing any kind of parasite. So if so anybody has worms or helmets inf infestations, uh, that's when we'll see an increase in eosinophils. Usually when they have an allergic or a parasitic infestation, I mean, it's not 5 or 10, but you'll see it greater than, I mean, double-digit numbers of eosinophils out there. Also, eosinophils are good in releasing cytokines, which we actually spent a chapter just talking about those, what cytokines do. That's just the chemicals that are released from the cell itself. So you can see a picture on the right-hand side of an eosinophil. You know, it's bilobed. The granules are pretty big. They're orangey kind of color, the eosin kind of stain color. Okay, basophils, that's less than 1%. You know, you don't really see that many of them out there. <clears throat> and the granules themselves, you know, are blue, which you really can't see them that much, but there's a reason for that. Um, but the granules contain histamine and heparin. Of course, histamine, you know, huge importance in allergic reactions. Uh, these granules are water soluble, so a lot of times in the staining process, they get washed off because there is water in that right stain that we use. So we really don't see a lot of them normally. Monocytes and macrophages. Remember, monocytes are in the peripheral blood. You can see 2 to 10% roughly, and there's a picture of a monocyte there. Uh, monocytes are usually pretty big cells out there. They've got um, a three-dimensional looking nucleus. I mean, you can see where it's all folded, and the cytoplasm is pretty big. It does have really tiny, fine granules in the cytoplasm. Real, I mean, you can see that something's there, but you really can't see them like you would in the neutrophils and stuff like that. But anyway, monocytes, um, when they go to the tissue, we actually call them macrophages. So a lot of times when we do fluids, looking at those under the microscope, that's when we'll see the macrophages. And you can also see it like in certain tissue biopsies and stuff like that. So macrophages are a huge part of the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. So if the innate macrophages are very important in phagocytizing. They're the first line of defense of eating anything foreign that gets in, in there and actually killing the microbes that might be there. I mean, if you ever cut yourself, uh, you can see how it gets red raised. You know, the whole inflammatory process occurs. And pus develops pretty quickly. It's amazing how it works. So the macrophages are doing their duty. Also, macrophages have an anti-tumor activity. In other words, they actually see when something is not right, when it's not foreign. It's like a quality control system it does. And it will actually destroy tumor cells. In other words, malignant cells out there. It also can eat parasitic you know, infestations, and it will secrete cytokines out there. In other words, it makes other cells do stuff that we want it to do. This is like the chemical communication that macrophages can have with other cells out there. The adaptive immune response is processing and presenting antigens to T cells. Now, if you remember, T cells are actually a type of lymphocyte out there. So the macrophages... You know, they actually will process, oh, this is something foreign. Uh, you need to do something about it. So what they're doing is they're getting the adaptive, the specific immune response tied in now. So that will actually present it to a T cell, which then we're going to engage the adaptive immune response. So the macrophages will produce cytokines and that help us with the T cells to regulate our immune response. In other words, yes, we need you to produce antibodies, we need you to destroy it, or it can say, hey, let's cut it off, we got enough immune system. Because, you know, you can have too much an immune response, hence autoimmunity. Start destroying your own cells out there. So you have to be careful with that also. So mast cells, if you look at mast cells there, mast cells look like basophils, but they're actually in the tissue. Um, we can see in the connective tissue, I mean, they look like a big basophil. I mean, it's actually a different lineage because it's in the tissue itself, but still we call them tissue basophils. 
Um, so they're important in having an immune response. And, you know, when a dermatologist does a biopsy, if he sees mast cells, then we know it's an allergic response. If we see, like, macrophages or neutrophils, then we're like, oh, it's probably an infectious process, bacteria or something that's causing the problem. Dendritic cells, um, if you remember when you took AMP1 with the nerves, they're long things sticking off, you know, because they look like dendrites of a nerve. That's why it gets this term. They play a huge role in innate and adaptive. Um, they are the most potent phagocytic cell out there. And they're the most effective antigen-presenting cell. Which, from now on, we're going to call antigen-presenting cell, APC. Um, so they're actually much better at doing this than a macrophage. We really don't see them in tissues, per se, that much or hard to find. But they are the best APC phagocytic cell out there. So the cells of the adaptive immune response are used, you know, down to just lymphocytes. So you can see there's a picture of a lymphocyte there. And that's roughly 20 to 40 percent of all the white cells out there in the peripheral blood are lymphocytes. Of course, there's B cells and there's T cells and there's natural killer cells and K cells. So if you're looking at the picture, you can see it's a small cell. Scanty amount of cytoplasm out there. It's very light blue. The stain's not too great on this picture, but whatever. Uh, round nucleus, and it's pretty condensed. Some of the lymphocytes we say, remember, are B cells and T cells. Well, one of the B cells, you know, once B cells are a major role producer of antibodies, that's what they do. Uh, to actually make them produce antibodies, they have to transform into plasma cells. But B cells have to be contacted by an antigen. In other words, the T cells telling them from an antigen presenting cell, like a dendritic cell, say, hey, we need antibodies made. So the B says, oh, okay, I'm going to transform into a plasma cell now. So plasma cells um, are usually oval. There's a picture of them uh, you'll see in your book. Uh, they're more oval, the nucleus is really eccentric, and it has like a pale area close to uh, the nucleus. And they are very important in producing antibodies. Um, because B cells, you know, they're actually in the bone marrow, but once they're out into the lymphatic system, you know, that's where we get that exposure to the antigens from the antigen-presenting cells. So B cells have on their surface immunoglobulins, CD markers 19, 20, and 21, and they're considered an MHC class 2. And we'll talk about MHC class 2 a little later. T cells are actually lymphocytes that start in the bone marrow, but they migrate to the thymus, hence the T cells. And they have the marker CD3 on them. Now there's different subtypes. Um, of T cells out there, the different CD markers, one of them is called a helper cell. The helper cells themselves are called CD4 cells. Um, they actually produce cytokines also, the chemical messaging type of compound, and they make uh, B cells produce antibodies, and they ex assist other T cells in what's called cell-mediated immunity, which we'll talk a, lot, a little bit and a little bit about that. Um, but helper cells are exactly what they do. They help the immune system. They tell the, the B cells, hey, we need antibody production. Now get on it. We need to hurry up. Let's get this done. So the other T cells out there are regulatory T cells, and that's another type of CD4 cell out there. They actually will help control the immune response. They can help shut it down. CD8 cells, uh, which we call cytotoxic T cells, you can see the TC and Treg up there. Or they are uh, cytotoxic cells, or CD8, and they will actually destroy tumor cells and virally infected cells. So here we're talking about the specific immune response. So we have helper T cells, regulatory T cells, and cytotoxic T cells out there, and they each have their individual functions to try to control as to what's going on. If you look in your textbook, you'll see a table 1-1. One, one. It will show the antigen marker, the CD marker, the cell type, and the function of it. You can see it there. So the innate lymphoid cells and the natural killer cells out there, they have a very 
important pole important part of the innate system um, so the innate lymphoid cells out there uh, remember they are considered non-specific so a major type of the innate system which means you know no memory non-specific they are called the natural killer cells they're very large uh, they sort of look like a monocyte almost and they're positive for CD marker 16 to 56 and natural killer cells have a very important part in that they can kill virally infected cells and tumor cells. In other words, we don't have to remember it. You know, they have no, you know, don't need prior exposure or anything like that. So they are able to destroy antibody coated target cells. In other words, you know, remember the B cells produce antibodies, antibodies land onto the target cells, and we'll talk more about that later in depth. So that's why the natural killer cells are like, oh my, it's targeted. I know to destroy it. You know, it's just like when you go to a store and they have like um, the clearance rack. Because you know if you go to the clearance rack, because that's what it's marked at, that's where you go to save money. So that's the same way natural killer cells do. They're like, hey, it's already coated with an antibody, you know, like a clearance label on it. So it, the target cells know to go there and destroy it. So it makes it a lot quicker. So it's amazing what it does. So the different organs of the immune system, we have primary and secondary. So the primary lymphoid organs are two different ones, the bone marrow and the thymus. Okay, so bone marrow, you probably already know, is in the core of all the long flat bones out there. So that's where we have all of our stem cells, which make red cells, white cells, monocytes, play with lymphocytes. Uh, that's where the B cells actually mature. The thymus is an organ that's basically located in the mid mediastinal area. It's just very small, flat. It's two lobes in there. You can actually see a picture of it in your textbook, page 9. Very small. That's where all the uh, T cells actually mature. And it actually gets smaller the older you get. The secondary lymphoid organs out there, this is the ones where the lymphocytes are mature come. So they come from the primary to the secondary. And this is where we have contact with any kind of foreign antigen out there. So some secondary lymphoid organs out there is the spleen, the lymph nodes, the malt, and the cult, the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue, and the cutaneous associated lymphoid tissue. So you all know when you get an infection, the first thing to do is feel for the lymph nodes in your neck. Uh, if somebody has cancer, they check the lymph nodes. So it's a great way to see what's going on, you know, in the body, any kind of foreign thing that could possibly be in there. So the spleen is the largest of the secondary uh, lymphoid organs out there. And it's usually located in the upper left quadrant of your abdomen, just below the diaphragm. And if you look inside, there's what's called red pulp and white pulp out there. Uh, the red pulp has got a lot of macrophages inside of it. And that is part of the extravascular hemolysis system. In other words, how remember how we destroyed our red cells so we could recycle them and use them again. The white pulp is just roughly, you know, 20% of the spleen. And that's where the lymphoid tissue is located. And it's usually a, around the little arterioles. Um, that are inside and it actually contains T cells and some B cells are actually in the follicles attached to that sheath inside of the white pulp. So you can look at the picture there and it shows you where the T cells are and all that. Now when we start talking about in hematology about the lymphomas, remember we talked about certain lymphomas being follicular, marginal, that kind of stuff. That's where they get those terms from. Because remember, lymphomas means it's in the lymphatic system. So that's a, where those terms come from. So lymph nodes, as you can see from that picture, they're everywhere. Um, they're usually near all joints, you know, where the arms and legs attach to the body. Um, they collect lymph fluid from all adjacent tissues. So they're a great key to us if anything inflammatory invasive is going on in the body itself. So, this is showing a typical, like, a lymphocyte here, or a lymph node, rather. So, lymphocytes 
and any foreign antigen at it there, you know, if it enters the lymph node, be the afferent lymphatic system, in other words, it's coming into the lymph node itself, B cells will be located in those follicles within that cortex there. So they will see it. So if we need to produce antibodies or something, that's where it can be done. That's where we get that uh, first initial contact so we can start producing antibodies, develop an immune response. T cells are mainly, mainly located in the paracortex. So you can see that they're a little bit farther out there. I mean, just look at the pictures. Paracortex and the actual cortex itself. So the malt and the cult, uh, malt, you know, like it says, the first letter, that's the mucosal surfaces, so any port coming into the body, mouth, nose, respiratory, your genital area, because mainly that's where any kind of foreign antigen is actually going to be coming in. This is where we'll have a lot of lymphocytes and macrophages present. I mean, that's why they, like, check your throat, you know, when you got a sore throat, look for your lymph nodes, that kind of stuff, uh, to see what's going on. So... Tonsils, pyre patches, were the lymph nodes that are actually located in the GI system itself. The cult is usually found on the skin. This is where we look for uh, T cells, monocytes, macrophages. You can actually see like an immune response on the skin itself. So, in summary, the innate immune system is the uh, the ability of the body to resist infection through a non specific, you know, like skin, it protects us. Uh, urine protects us because it keeps fluid going through. Uh, the pH of our stomach, you know, so acidic, it kills things. Uh, tears in our eyes, you know, all that stuff, that saliva, you know, all those things out there, very nonspecific. On the other hand, adaptive, now adaptive is very specific. It remembers things where the innate does not remember. So the data is very specific, very memory-oriented, and it really depends on the lymphocytes per se. But remember, all blood cells themselves arise out of stem cells that are located in the bone marrow themselves. So the different types of lymphocytes, or excuse me, leukocytes, which you all know from hematology, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, monocytes, and lymphs, um, the tissue cells that were involved in the immunity are the mast cells, the dendritic, and the macrophages. Remember, which were monocytes in the peripheral bloodstream. And cells that are involved in the innate immune response are very phagocytic. I mean, that's, that's what we look for, remember, in neutrophils and monocytes. And then we look for, like, doly bodies, toxic granulation, vacuoles. I mean, that tells us information as to what time the infectious process is going on. It's very important for us to communicate that to the physician so that you know an infectious process is, is going on at that time. Uh, lymphocytes are a very important part of the adaptive immune response. Remember B cells are in the bone marrow. T cells are located in the thymus. B cells, once they've been exposed to an antigen, a foreign thing, will differentiate, transform into a plasma cell, and they will produce antibodies. Like I said, we got a chapter just on that. T cells, you know, there's helper cells, cytotoxic cells, and regulator cells. Then there's natural killer cells. That's the third type of T cell out there. And they have the capability of killing virally infected cells or cancerous cells. Uh, so it's nonspecific, no memory or anything like that. So we have a lot of lines of defense to protect us. The bone marrow and the thymus are considered primary lymphoid organs. That's where lymphocyte maturation will occur. Once the lymphocytes get out to the secondary lymphoid organs, which is the spleen, the malt, the cult, the lymph nodes, uh, that's where we actually have the lymphocytes contact the actual foreign thing out there. Okay, so that's the end of our slideshow. Um, so what you need to do is make sure you look through the book, actually read it. Uh, look at the study guide at the end of each particular chapter. Uh, you can look at the case studies. Look at those review questions. You can actually see the answers in the back of the book. Uh, we'll actually talk about this in class and review it. Uh, this is a very fundamental stuff of immunology. Um, you got to know it, so make sure you take your time and study. 
If you do run into any questions or concerns or issues, please let me know, and I'll be more than happy to answer any of those kind of questions. Thank you.